folks, it's Greg here with MaritimeGardening.com and uh, it's time to do another garden plan video for my 2022 garden. I have a bit of a process I use for this where I, I make note of everything I did last year and reflect on it and then decide where everything should go uh, in the coming year. And so this is going to be a two-part video. The first part is just reviewing last year's garden, uh, what went right, what went wrong, um, some reflections on all of that. Um, and then the second part will be, uh, you know, the varieties of everything I'm going to buy for uh, 2022 and where I'm going to stick everything. And what you see here in front of you is uh, a picture of last year's garden with uh, labels of where everything went. So, uh, you know, it's funny, a lot of new gardeners, they have like little uh, sticks with uh, everything written down, what they've planted in their garden. Um, I don't really do it that way. I mean... You know, I sort of, I, I write it out like this, and then usually once the plants are four or five inches high, sometimes even when they're an inch high, I just know what they are. Uh, just, you know, you, you do this enough, you get a feel for everything. So I, I don't have like, you know, a little steak with kale written on it in my kale garden. I just know that's where the kale goes. Um, anyway, backing up a little bit and explaining my process here for how I plan the garden out. There's, there's lots of... Uh, garden planning software out there and you can use those apps for your smartphone and all that sort of stuff. I, I don't really get into any, any of that. Uh, professionally for my job, I, I work using uh, Microsoft Excel. Um, a lot of computers have it on them anyway or something like Excel. Uh, so, But anything would work. You could do this in uh, PowerPoint, you could do this in Word, you could use it in any sort of video, any sort of editing software where you can paste in it because all this is is a picture with labels on it, right? So, you know, if you can get up high enough off a deck or off a roof or even up on a ladder, a step ladder, just take some pictures from overhead or use a borrow a drone from a friend, something like that, or even hold a camera up on a stick really high, <laughs> pointing down <laughs> in video mode and just, just take a video of your entire garden in pan panoramic view. You don't have to be that sophisticated. If you had a, you know, a stick 20 feet high or 10 feet high and you just held it up with the lens pointing down, you could probably get a pretty good overhead view of most of your garden. So it doesn't have to be that high tech. You take a picture of your garden, you print it off, and then you start writing on it with a pen, <laughs> right? <laughs> Where everything went last year. So that's what I've been doing year after year. I just do it in Excel because I'm used to it. Uh, I've been doing this uh, this way since uh, 2014. Uh, if you if you ever talk to Mrs. Maritime Gardening, I'm not the most organized person or the most anal retentive person. This is probably the most anal retentive thing I do. And even then, I don't really, I'm, I'm so poor at being like that. Uh, I, I never really stick 100% with my plan. Um, the, the purpose of planning it out, and I'm going to walk you through this whole sort of process, is so that when the garden season's upon you, you don't have to do so much thinking. Uh, I, I recall when I started gardening years ago, uh, there were a lot of April, you know, you get home from work, you have supper, and then you got X hours of, of usable light before it gets dark and you want to get out to your garden. And I would find myself going out to the garden then going back into the shed then going back to the garden then going back to the shed and then rethinking this and a lot of time just staring and thinking and all this sort of stuff. Um, and that's all time well spent uh, from a certain point of view. Um, but, you know, you're not getting anything done, <laughs> right? You're, you're thinking, but you're not getting a lot done. So I think it's useful to do a lot of your thinking in the winter, right? You got a nice picture. You, you, your members are rel relatively fresh. It's better to do this in, let's say, September when things are still really fresh as well. But anyway, you do it, you do it when you can. I tend to do it in January because there's, there's nothing left to do out there. Everything's just frozen right now and covered in snow. So um, it's much more uh, uh, uplifting, <laughs> right? Positive <laughs> to look at a beautiful picture of your garden from the year before and uh, think about how great it's gonna be next year and just focus on that, right? I find that's a better use of your energy and a, a, a really good uh, sort of cure for the, the winter blues, uh, winter doldrums. So uh, every year I, I have a picture of like the previous year's garden and then usually some sort of plan based on the previous year's garden uh, and then how the garden went so like for instance for 2017 right I'm using the picture from 2016 so I have a picture from 2016 and I got a label where everything went I had carrots here I had tomatoes here I had beets here and so on right 
and then 2017 is my plan and I usually have some notes of things that worked or didn't like this this uh, I'm gonna so what I'm gonna do is be flipping back and forth between gardens and plans gardens and plants that sort of thing right 2017 plan I was saying don't bother with a uh, scarecrow the scarecrow never worked it, it didn't scare anything away it only, only the only thing the scarecrow scared was me every time I turned around and caught this thing in the corner of my eye I just about have a heart attack um, so anyway 2017 plan and then there's the 2017 garden right so the 2017 plan is usually based on a picture of the previous year's garden so this is right and then your 2017 garden is where things actually went right now I got a 2018 plan based on my 2017 gardens photograph and then my 2018 garden where things actually went and so on it was a 2019 plan right and here's the 2019 garden wow look at that right uh 2020 plan 2020 garden and so on so now we're into 21 2021 this is where we are we're sort of reviewing the difference this video part one of the 2022 garden plan is just reviewing the difference between the 2020 one plan and a 2021 garden and everything I learned from the things that went right the things that went wrong uh, little experiments I did just playing around uh, and the insights that ga gave me for the coming year uh, so I'll be flipping back and forth between the plan and the garden they're kind of easy to tell apart because um, I'm using different pictures right uh, different color and so on and this is a neat thing I started doing this year just for those that if you want to use the system I use using something like Excel or Word or whatever um, for these labels you notice how this here one uh, the labels are kind of hard to see I mean they're still readable but they're kind of hard to read and now they're much more they stand out a lot more so all I've really done is for uh, on top of the picture I have a I've inserted a rectangle a black rectangle that's like 85% I think it's 71% transparent okay so it's a black rectangle it's 71 trans it just shades it and then all of these labels are you just you just have this thing called um, uh, bring to front right so all the labels are in front of the shade so they're extra white <laughs> right <laughs> so um, that's how it, you know like the labels look better actually to tell you the truth I, I use uh, for my uh, th thumbnails for my YouTube channel, I use Excel to do all the graphics for that. It's not a graphics software, but it's like I use it professionally, Excel. So it's like the only thing I know how to use well. <laughs> so I use it for my website graphics <laughs> for everything, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, not for editing, you know, the videos, but for any sort of picture, any, anything where I'm messing around with a picture, <laughs> I'm using Excel, believe it or not. Uh, so I do this in Excel, but yeah, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you could just take a picture and write on it with a pencil or a pen or put post-it notes on it or whatever. You don't need to do any of this, or you can use some app if you want to get into all that. But I, you know, I have a pretty large garden and I find this works really well. If I, my garden was smaller, I would just uh, take a picture of it or even just draw a diagram of it. Um, so oftentimes in the spring, uh, when I'm going out to plant things, uh, I'll come in, I'll look at this picture, and then I'll get a piece of paper and I'll draw. Sometimes I'll print this off too, but I'll uh, often I'll just get a little piece of paper and I'll like draw, you know, the shape of this section of the garden, and then I'll just make little rough <laughs> rectangles where the gardens are, and I'll just jot down the things I'm going to plant that evening, and then I'll just add to that piece of paper. So it's in my back pocket, you know, and I don't have to think when I go to the garden. I'm just you know, okay, tonight I'm going to plant uh, kale and carrots and beets and carrots and spinach if I get to, and lettuce, you know. So I'll sort of go out with a list of things to do like that and see how many of those I can knock off in one night, right? And I don't have to think about anything else when I go to the garden because I've got a plan. And I've done all my thinking and planning and scheming and plotting, <laughs> all that sort of stuff uh, in the dead of winter. When I've got time to think and rethink and move these things around, right? As I come up with a plan, I'll, I'll move things around, right? Um, so, 2021 plan, right? Uh, I'm going to start up in this here corner here. This is the uh, north. This this direction up here is north. So this way is east. This way is west over here. So I'm up in the north north end the north end of the garden. I'd planned to put beets, potatoes, beans, carrots. Uh, I hadn't there was a there's a bed here you can't see it but there's a bed right here 
I didn't know what I was going to do with that. And I had a perennial called Bloody Dock. There's other names for it, but it's sort of like a weed that tastes good in soup. <laughs> I planted that there. Um, so then what I actually did was I, I followed the plan. Beans, potatoes, or sorry, uh, over here was um, beets, potatoes, beans, carrots. And in that, that, that bed that had no, no real plan, I, I went with spinach. OK, uh, and actually uh, I, I wasted the space because I planted spinach. And then when the spinach bolted in uh, July, <clears throat> instead of putting something else in there, making use of the space, I just let it go wild. I mean, when you have a huge garden like this, you can sort of you can waste space sometimes. And it might even be good for the garden to just leave some things alone once in a while. Um, but anyway, I, I, you know, I regret that I could have I could have planted something there even another batch of spinach for the fall, right? And actually, I learned something last year that all these beds that are in this north end, uh, it's this relatively shady spot, right? When you're planting uh, a garden year after year after year, it's, you know, it's and you're, when you're out in your garden at all times of the year, early spring, dead of summer, fall, late fall, winter, all that sort of stuff, you do learn where the sunny spots are, right? For, like for my garden, um, this row up here where it says beets, potatoes, beans, carrots, spinach, this is, it never gets 100% sun. There's, there, it's in shade at various parts of the year. Okay, and at the height of summer, it actually wouldn't be a good place to have, wouldn't be a bad place to have spinach and lettuce um, because it's just so shady there. Um, these beds here where it says parsnips, cukes, carrots, garlic, tomato, this is sunny. Everything grows really well here. Same with here. Right. This is a this, uh, this is the hot spots, the sunny spots. Along here, this is uh, actually. I mean, you can't see it from this vantage point, but there's a, a garden bed that just goes along the entire perimeter of uh, the base of the hill here. I'm standing on a, a hill that's fairly steep, about 45 degrees uh, in terms of the angle of pitch of the hill, um, and I've got you know a bed that's about two and a half feet from front to back all the way along this perimeter. And I use the fence posts to delineate where different things will go, right? So the fence posts are about seven feet apart, give or take, right? So basically I had leeks in a seven by two and a half foot bed, I had potatoes in a seven by two and a half foot bed, and parsnips and Swiss chard and so on, um, right? So I had these here. These all grew well. Now, at the height of summer, this these beds are in the shade in late late later in the day right the sun is way off to the right here on the other side of this little hill and it's a little bit shady here but early in the season because this this is south right the sun is lower like early in the spring the sun rises over here and it sets over there somewhere but as we go later and later in the summer the sunrise starts moving over this way east and by very late in the summer the sun actually rises way over here, almost like northeast, right? Uh, so it moves around a lot, okay? So the point is that early in the year, the sun's coming up this way in the southeast, and it's it's coming at this angle at everything. So this hill, everything, it's like one of the first places to melt, right? Because it's just the sun's... Right. Everything here, as the sun's rising, it's being blocked by these trees until it's about yay high. Right. And then I can actually get an angle and start getting at things. It's not till it's quite high that it actually shines on these. So in like uh, March, uh, all these beds here where it says beets, potatoes, beans, carrots and spinach. Uh, these tend to be the last beds where the, the snow goes away. They're the last beds to thaw out. They're the coldest beds in spring. Right. Um, whereas these ones here in the center of the garden tend to thaw out fairly quickly and thaw out soon. Okay. So it's important to understand that aspect of sun because it's probably one of the most important things to contemplate when you're deciding where things should be planted. And there's other things that are important to understand too, uh, like uh, certain parts of your garden might be wetter than others and you either have to plant things that don't mind being wet, <laughs> don't mind wet soil, or you have to, uh, you know, remediate that somehow. Um, but oftentimes, we, we as gardeners, when things don't go well with a plant, we, um, and this is just my experience of 
reading what people discuss on gardening groups on Facebook. It's basically the way I get myself into the mind of other gardeners that aren't me is to look at what people are talking about on Facebook, the questions they're asking, asking and the kinds of answers that other gardeners tend to offer. So if something doesn't grow well, uh, the knee-jerk reaction is to uh, suggest that the plant needs more nitrogen, potassium, or uh, what's the other one? Oh, why can't I remember that? Nice nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, right? Um, NPK. So the knee-jerk reaction of most gardeners is, oh, you need more phosphorus, you need more potassium, you need more nitrogen. Or they'll go to something even more exotic. They'll say, oh, you need more magnesium, you need more calcium, all that sort of stuff. And I'll tell you, as an experienced gardener, nine times out of ten, the problem why something isn't growing is because it's not getting enough sun or it's getting too much sun. That's it's rarely a problem where I live that something's getting too much sun. Um, it's just not, you know, an insanely hot place, not an insanely sunny place. Um, so anyway, it's either getting too much sun or not enough, usually not enough. Because uh, you remember, sun is the source of energy for a plant. We, 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 you know, we, we don't get energy from the sun. We get I mean, we get some heat, but really the energy that we use, we don't power up with sun. We eat stuff, and that powers us up, right? Uh, but plants, their source of energy is the sun. That's where they get it from. They they convert the sun's energy and store it in their roots and store you know use it and you know, turn it into sugars and use it. And then we eat them and we get the energy that way. Okay. Uh, so if plants not getting enough energy, it can't grow. <laughs> it's not going to be healthy. Um, so it's really important to understand where the sun is, because nine times out of ten, if you've got a problem with your plant, it's probably sun. If it's not sun, it's either too wet, the soil is either too wet or not wet enough. <laughs> it's usually really simple, nine times out of ten. Not enough sun, <laughs> or it's either too wet or not wet enough. <laughs> That's it. And then, you know, the other... The other um, one time out of ten, it's it's any of uh, you know a hundred different possible causes that get very exotic. Um, but anyway, suffice it to say, understanding where the sun shines the most in your garden is really important for for plants that are extremely demanding in terms of how much sun they want, like tomatoes. Uh, but also anything you want to perform well, like garlic. Uh, I have learned over the years not to waste time planting it along this uh, north end here. Um, sorry, this is this is south here, but because it's south, it's against the trees. It doesn't get the. It's basically on the on the north side of the tree line, so it, it's in the shade, right? Um, anyway, if I plant garlic anywhere along here where it says beets, potatoes, beans, carrots, spinach, uh, it, it's like half the size. A garlic grown here will be twice the size as a garlic grown over here, <laughs> right? Or a garlic grown over here. So it's not worth my while to put the garlic over there. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm growing it. I want to I want to have big, fat, good garlic. I don't want to waste time. And there's some things that don't mind the shade. Right. And some things that actually kind of like a little bit of shade, especially as the summer gets hotter and hotter, um, like all your things like spinach and lettuce, um, they they don't like to be too hot. Right. There's a there's a soil temperature that just causes the plant to bolt. So it's useful to have those in a shady garden. <laughs> Right. And because these shady beds take so long to to heat up, um, there's other things that it makes more sense to plant much later. Like if I plant potatoes in these garden beds, it's not worth it to plant the potatoes early because the soil is still so cold early in the year. Right. You know, when the sun's rising over here and this these beds are all in the shade, it doesn't make any sense to have plant an early variety of potato like Red Norland here. Right. Makes sense to plant potatoes over here early in the year because it's getting sun. But it makes perfect sense if I have a spinach garden and the spinach is starting to bolt because it's like uh, late June or something like that. Um, I can plant potatoes in it then because by then the sun isn't rising over here. It's rising over here. So so this bed now, because the sun's rising in the east, it's getting morning light because the angles change. It's coming from over there instead of from between these trees. There's a nice path. So it gets much better light later in the year, right? And then as we go back to fall, the angle of the sun changes back to here, right? So if I was going to plant, um, uh, you know, like a lettuce or a spinach for a fall crop, it wouldn't make any sense to have them in these beds 
because as we move into the fall, the sun starts rising back in the south. And these are very, very shady and they just slow right down. Right. So you, these are all little things you, you know, if, you're, if you've got a really large space you're trying to work with and there's different levels of sun in different places, uh, understanding how that works really makes a big difference in the kind of performance you can get into the garden, which in the end, in the end will affect your your satisfaction with your garden. Right. So one thing uh, last year, another thing with with this plan here is every year I have down at the bottom notes. Right. Don't do this, do this, don't do that again, do this, you know, always something like that. Don't, you know, only scab resistant taters. You know, I've, I've, I've found out over the years that basically for what, you know, for a various number of reasons, uh, plants in my garden tend to get uh, scab. So there's just no point in planting a potato that's prone to scab. There are varieties of potato that are uh, highly resistant to scab. Um, instead of, you know, throwing all kinds of sulfur in the soil or doing this or doing that or following some, some person's advice uh, on how to avoid it because based on what they do, which, you know, not always, doesn't always work. <laughs> you want to find out the hard way that some, some person on Facebook's solution for scab really doesn't do anything. Uh, it's just a thing they do. And the fact that they don't have the, you know, the, I don't know, it's a fungus or a bacteria in the soil that causes it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not necessarily the best solution. Um, anyway, uh, another solution is to just plant scab resistant varieties of potato. That does limit the number of potatoes, the variety of potatoes you can grow in your soil, but it does also eliminate a lot of headaches. Um, so every year I'll have like notes like that down on the bottom. Uh, you know, try turnip, kibosh, the kohlrabi, uh, you know, start certain plants under a dome. Right. Like if I look at my 2021 plan, for instance, right, um, I said that my uh, New Orleans need to be chitted in March. Uh, chitting means you, you, you know, if you have potatoes that you've stored as seed potatoes, you take them out of the dark, cold place they're stored in and you put them in a window in the sun and you sort of let them warm up. Uh, I found that with uh, most of my varieties, like uh, Russet Burbanks, uh, I don't have to do that till April. But the New Orleans, they start growing at a much colder temperature than a lot of other varieties. So around mid-March, I have them in my garage where it's like five Celsius most of the winter. If I don't take those out of the box in March, if I take them out in April when I'm thinking of planting them, they'll have, the eyes will be really leggy. The eyes might be a foot long by then. So if I take them out mid-March, they have nice little short fat eyes, which is ideally what you want. You just take them out and set them, you know, I usually set them in egg cartons near a window so they can get a bit of light. And uh, the eyes just become sort of short and fat and stubby and uh, they grow really, really well. They sort of wake up. You're waking up the potato. You can do that like a month before you're going to plant them. Um, uh, I had a note, get June bearing strawberries. Uh, which I did last year. I also got to uh, change my variety of uh, raspberries. Uh, get pear trees. Uh, wasted too much kale, right? Every year I've got some some plan, like uh, lose the cold frames. I think in the previous year, uh, where is it now? I see I used to have cold frames along here facing south. That's off to the right. And uh, I just decided I, I didn't like... And there's there's advantages to having cold frames, but because I, I put like domes like over here, right? I put domes in all my beds. Any bed in my garden could be a cold frame anytime I want because I just stick a dome on it. So it doesn't make sense to have dedicated dome beds. Uh, you got to devote so much more uh, lumber to them, uh, space. They, they just it didn't make sense. I think I also had some some plan like um, <clears throat> reposition the fence. Right. So in 2021, I actually did, uh, you know, the fence used to go along here and I moved the fence and made the fence bigger. So every year I've got those, you know, some sort of advice to myself of, of things to do. Uh, plant more beans. So in 2021, I did not have enough beans. Uh, I really hardly had any beans in my freezer. I planted two beds of beans because the year before I felt like I had too much and uh, yeah, this year I just didn't get enough. <laughs> so plant more beans. Uh, when I planted my carrots in 2021, uh, I put like plastic uh, 
they were like plastic rectangles, <laughs> a wooden frame that's a rectangle with plastic stretched across it and uh, to get the carrots to germinate, but I, it actually made them too hot. And I think that's why uh, my first two plantings of carrots failed, um, didn't germinate. Uh, so I had a heck of a time getting carrots going and I've never had problems before. And the one difference this year compared to other years <clears throat> is I was trying to do all these different tricks to get them to germinate. But I think uh, carrots are sensitive to temperature. There's, there's a temperature they need to germinate, but if you get them too hot, they just shut down and stop. It kills the seed. So I think I'd cook them. So don't cook the carrots. Uh, Deer-proof perennials on the hill. Yeah, I've got a, uh, a terrace bed up on the hill here, and everything I plant in it doesn't grow well. <laughs> and I don't know if it's because the soil is too wet or the soil is too dry or it's not rich enough or whatever. I mean, I, I put good compost in the bed, and I prepared this bed the way I would any other bed. And... Uh, Everything I, it's been two years planting on this hill and this beautiful little terrace bed. And every year it's, it's, it's just it's a crap garden. <laughs> so uh, I decided I'm going to put like down in the garden here in this corner, I've got um, what's this bloody dock and French sorrel. These are basically like weeds. Um, and in another part of my garden, I've got Egyptian walking onions and they're deer proof i mean generally speaking at least in my experience i find deer deer don't bother those things um, so uh, yeah <laughs> deer proof perennials on the hill meaning one of those things i just mentioned or herbs are going to go up in this bed and i'm just going to leave it like that for a few years uh, i'm going to keep mulching it and just be patient with it i mean there's things i could do to sort of improve the soil there but why not just plant something i've got all this stuff inside my fence that's deer proof why do I have a deer proof perennial inside the fence? Why don't I put that outside the fence? Because it's deer proof. And th these plants, you know, they're not very as demanding in terms of soil quality because they're weed like. And like all weeds, they sort of grow anywhere. I'm sure these things would grow in my dry, you know, in a gravel driveway <laughs> if you let them. Um, so why not just, they're, they're things I like and I like to have, but why am I giving them my prime real estate? I'll just stick them out here. They'll be just fine. I'll get all the sorrel and bloody dock and Egyptian walking onions I could possibly want. I'll have them up here. And down here, I'll plant something that's a bit more uh, valuable to me, right? That, uh, you know, uh, would want to be in a spot like this. Okay. So that's what that little piece of advice is about. Uh, try a new kale. Yeah, I've been planting the same two types of kale for a couple of years now. I'm getting, I always get bored of stuff, so... I'm going to try a new type of kale, but that'll we'll talk about that in the next video. Uh, go back to collard. So last year I had cabbage down here and it was just inundated with pests. I'd never seen anything like it. Uh, worst cabbage in the history of the world. <laughs> you know, I could, and I did a video on this, you know, I could have mitigated that by treating them a bit more, you know, using some of the, the various products I use from uh, Safers to uh, just sort out the, the slugs and the snails and the uh, this small white, it's a kind of white butterfly that lays uh, caterpillars on your, that whole family of plant just destroys them. Um, I could have done that, but, uh, yeah, I just, <laughs> I found myself, uh, last year I planted cabbage instead of collard greens and I found myself missing collards. So I'm going to go back to growing collards. They grow, collards grow really well in my garden. So why am I, why not grow them? Why, why give that up, right? Uh, oh, and I've got a, a bit of a drainage problem in my garden. So over here, there's a hill here. Water comes down the hill. There must be like almost like a river inside this hill. But it comes down the hill and it gathers down around here. And it literally runs right down here. And various times of the year, if you look closely at some of my garden tours, you'll see like a canyon <laughs> developing here. So the water it basically gathers at the base of the hill here. And then it just goes down here and takes everything with it, including like all the sand in my pathways and stuff like that. And actually, I think I had an apple tree growing here a couple of years ago and it died. And I think it's just so wet. It just didn't agree with it, right? So I've got an idea to use some big O and, you know, do a, a sort of major project to deal with that, um, which would make a great video. 
Um, but that, you know, I can't do anything out there right now. Everything's frozen solid. But I got a major project to sort of run a, a, some sort of perforated pipe all along here and then connect a T to it and have it run down down the hill. And I might even put a goldfish pond here, uh, just basically a place to collect water. Uh, why not? It'd just be that much easier to water the garden. Yes, I have another goldfish pond, and that would be two goldfish ponds, but who cares <laughs> if it works, right? Uh, I found if you've got a, a hole full of water, it's going to get algae. So if you have goldfish in it, they eat the algae. So, <laughs> And they poop in the water, which kind of makes it like a fertilizer. <laughs> <laughs> so it works really, really well. Uh, so I have my own little well right in the garden. Anyway, it's something I'm playing with, toying around with ideas, okay? Um, okay, so there's those those sort of lessons learned, right, um, from last year. Uh, and there's probably a couple others I didn't jot down that will come to me later on as the video goes. But anyway, there was that. Um, this bed here I has been a sort of tulip garden with some irises that never look good and uh, strawberries. But you can see my 2021 plan was for, for that to be a strawberry garden because it's been a strawberry garden for a number of years. Same with this one here. But as the season progressed in 2021, the strawberries really came in really weak. And they came in really weak right here too. And at some point as the uh, season progressed, I just ripped them all out. I said, these strawberries are no good anyway. I'd, I'd ordered, you know, these were, um, what are they called, day neutral strawberries, and I'd ordered uh, June bearing ones to, to plant somewhere else. Uh, so I just went with that instead, and I decided, you know, this garden, because it's the first thing you see when you walk in, it should be something big and showy and nice, uh, and also something edible. <laughs> you know, I'll keep putting tulips in there because it, it makes, uh, makes my wife happy. But, you know, by, I don't know, whatever it is, June or July, the tulips are done. They look like crap, you know, so you got to have something growing there. Um, so I thought maybe I had one kale plant I jammed into that bed last year. Anyway, I'll stick, I'll, I'm basically going to use this garden for overflow. That is to say, I'll have kale growing somewhere, and when it gets too thick and I thin it out, I'll reposition it in this bed. Kale or squash or something like that. There's, there's things I always have to thin out. You know, I, I tend to plant my squash in threes. And then at some point, you know, along the season, I, I thin those down to one squash per mound sort of thing. Uh, and the other squash are perfectly viable. They can be moved and they'll grow well if they're given a nice place to live. So anyway, this bed here is going to be an overflow bed probably for kale this year. Um, that's what I've, you know, sort of learned. I mean, it was... I'd stuck a kale there last year, so the plan was it for it to be strawberries and ended up having one kale in it <laughs> and nothing else. You know, it had an iris, I suppose. Next year, it's going to be a kale garden. Uh, what was the other weird thing that happened uh, last year? Uh, this was planned to be garlic. That worked out really well. Down here. So I was going to put the strawberries down here, and I was going to make this bed corn and beans. And uh, at the last minute, I decided not to bother growing corn. I wish I had because we had a crazy hot summer, probably the hottest summer ever, and it would have been a great year to grow corn, but I didn't bother. So instead of having strawberries down here and corn and beans, these, these are beds. It's like a the bed here. There's like a three by 12 bed here and another one here and another one here. Uh, instead of doing that, it's the same. I, I put raspberries down here, right? There, there had been raspberries all along the fence where it says sunchokes and potatoes. Uh, I don't know what I'd planned to put down there. I didn't even write anything down there. I just I tend to just, you know, certain parts of the garden, I just like, I don't, there's always a section of the garden I don't make a plan for because um, it's like a little degree of freedom, right? Where I can just, you know, if anything I forget to plant or anything I change my mind, I can stick it in that spot, right? So it's also a good part of your garden plan is to have a, some portion of your garden, 10%, 1 20th of the space or whatever, unplanned so that you can um, use that as a, a solution to a problem or if you have some new idea or a whim or some experiment you want to run you can put it there anyway i put raspberries down here and i did uh, potatoes and peas here right and this one it was uh, zucchini so i never did beans along here that's probably why i didn't have as many beans <laughs> and uh, as the uh, what was it now? 
Well, wait a minute now, because one of these was strawberries. One of these became strawberries. Which one was it? Potatoes and peas? Corn and beans? Zucchini? My goodness, what happened now? One of these became strawberries, I know, because they're strawberries now. <laughs> Maybe I'm missing a bed. Did I mislabel one of these? Good God. Potatoes and peas. I'm missing a bed. There's a third bed. That's what it says. There's another one here. This. <laughs> yeah, okay. There's another one there. That's the strawberries. Okay. Sorry about that. So there's one, two, three, and then this one here. Yes. Okay, so there's basically one, two, three, four, and then this square garden. So I uh, hope this is not too confusing. Um, anyway, uh, I made one of these beds instead of it being a, a bean, like I'd always planted one of these rows had been beans. And instead of doing that, um, it's now a permanent perennial strawberry bed because it's a good sunny spot, right? So I'll get good strawberries there. They came in really, really well. And uh, I'm expecting big, big things for this June. Um, so that's just one of those little things, you know, like I'd ordered strawberries because remember I I had this note in my 2021 plan, uh, get June bearing strawberries. So I got them in 2021 and I was like, well, where the hell are they going to go? Well, I want to give them a good spot. I didn't want to put them in one of these beds. Uh, so I ended up just committing this, this space over here, this three by 12 bed to strawberries. I also put some over here, um, which... You know, it, it, sure, it doesn't get the best sun in late summer, but st again, these are June bearings, so they they do all their important <laughs> growing uh, in early spring. So this will get really good spring light in this spot, sort of at the base of this south-facing slope. So they, these will do just fine. Okay, uh, so I, that's another area where I, I broke from the plan. Uh, same with here. This. This here was a, uh, a strawberry bed, right? But I, instead, I made it a tomato bed because uh, the strawberries weren't coming in well. And at some point in the season, I just said, the heck with it. I want nice tomatoes. The tomatoes grew really, really well here. It's not a really big bed, uh, but I just ripped everything out and stuck tomatoes in. <laughs> I actually just went to the store and bought some transplants and stuck them in. I didn't, didn't mess around. Same with the tomatoes over here. Uh, almost all my tomatoes this year. I, other years where I direct seed my tomatoes and do that, do a really good job of it. This year, I, for whatever reason, I did a poor job of it, so I just ended up buying them. I had some direct seeded tomatoes come in, and I even had some I started in a, on a window cell in my kitchen. But uh, yeah, uh, I didn't do the the big uh, direct seeding under uh, you know plastic dome uh, tomato project like I've done in previous years. That's why you didn't see any videos about about that process in that year. Now, I'll probably do it again this year. We'll, we'll see how, where things go. Uh, okay, so there's another one where I had planned to do one thing and changed my mind and done, done something else. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else where I broke. Another thing I reflected was that um, this having sorrel and bloody dock here, I think I've alluded to this further, is just a waste of that space, yes. Um, now, going on to this section of the garden, most of this was stuck according to plan. Uh, the only thing that really went off the rails in this side of the garden was this bed right down in the corner. So I told myself to plant beans down here. And as the season progressed, I started getting mustard greens down here, which I like. So I let them grow and they grow so fast and so aggressively. Um, I really couldn't get a decent bean garden here. They just, they just out competed and just, the beans and mustard greens do not get along together. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> so this ended up just being a kind of useless weed garden. Also, I mean, it's hard to see from this point of view, but in this previous year, it's in a corner. It's not a good garden to have beans in because they're difficult to plant, right? I can't, I can't stand outside the fence. It, it's butted right up in this corner, so I can, I can only get at it from this side and from over here. I really can't reach in. So it's a garden bed that just doesn't make sense to have a thing like beans, because when you have beans growing, when they're producing, you have to pick them every two days. And it's just a pain to get at this garden. So really, this is a garden where you grow a thing like a pumpkin or a squash or, 
you know, something that you just harvest once. Onions wouldn't be bad, you know, because you just basically, they just grow. And then there's one day you come out, you pick them all, <laughs> bring them in, <laughs> right? Potatoes wouldn't be bad because you're not in and out and in and out. You just, you go in, you mess the whole garden up, you take the potatoes out, and then you're done with the garden for the year. So there's certain things that would work for a corner garden like this and certain things that are just stupid things to grow in a corner garden. <laughs> so I have to come up with some new plan for next year. I haven't, still haven't completely decided what I'm going to jam there. But it's going to be something. It's certainly not going to be beans or anything that has to be like regularly uh, managed and worked on. But uh, I'll figure that out as we go. Um, again, I'm not planting uh, cabbage. This, this, uh, this bed where I grew planted to grow garlic... Um, for whatever reason, this garden gets good sun, but the, I, I just think either the soil there is too wet because the water comes down the hill, or it's just poor soil. It's one of the two. Uh, everything I plant here does poorly. Everything. <laughs> Even beans don't do that well. Uh, so I think what I planted here for, uh, I've already planted uh, in that bed. Uh, you can't even see it here, but it's like up here sort of thing. Uh, is um, sunchokes because they, they seem to grow just about anywhere. Um, so, yeah, last year I learned that I really shouldn't plant anything that's super important to me, <laughs> anything I want to do well, because all the garlic that came out of this were sort of small and, you know, just not, not ideally sized, maybe half or a third the size of the beds where they grow well. Another thing that I've realized uh, is that th these beds here are prime real estate. It's really sunny here. Everything I plant in them does really, really well. I can grow anything in these beds, and I'm wasting my time growing Egyptian walking onions. And th these are all 4 by 10 beds, and it's just a waste of prime real estate to grow something like an Egyptian walking onion. They're, they're a wonderful thing to have in your garden. You've got the sort of per perpetual source of the... Uh, what would you call those shallots or not shallots the uh you know the onion greens there's a term for that it's just not coming to mind but you've got a perpetual source of onion greens whenever you want them from like may all the way through the season and you can also use the the actual onion bulb like a shallot okay scallions is where i was looking so you've got a perpetual source of scallions and you've got a shallot like you know uh onion to use which is stronger than an onion but but weaker than a garlic nice but really I don't find I, I need this much space devoted to it and I could probably get away with growing these maybe outside the fence I'm, I'm gonna assume that they're deer proof um, so one of my plans and I should have done this like in September but I didn't is to get them all out of this bed and put them somewhere else <laughs> maybe I'll stick some of them in with the sun chokes that are growing over here put them somewhere else because it's just this is prime real estate. You you, you know the, the place that gets the best sun with the best soil. Um, you you put the plants you that are the most demanding, either the plants that are the most important to you or the plants that are the most demanding. Right? This would be a good place to try to grow peppers or tomatoes or something like that. Uh, and it's a nice bed where I can access. Like I grew tomatoes down here way back at the end of the uh, garden. Right? 2021 was tomatoes and 2020. Uh, 2020, I had squash down here. That was a good thing to grow because you don't really, you're not regularly harvesting, maintaining squash plants. You just, they just do what they do. And, you know, in October or September, you pick the squash. Tomatoes, you, you sort of have to manage them and maintain them. Um, and, uh, you know, at a certain time of year, you're picking them every couple days. Um, so having a bed jammed up against a fence like that, where you can only get at it from one side and it's, you know four by ten or four by eight this doesn't make any sense so uh, you know i will not plant a thing like that. again it's just like the one over here and if, if if the bed is hard to get at and hard to manage and hard to work on you tend to neglect it you just will at least maybe maybe this is more of a person in their late 40s thing <laughs> so it just, just doesn't make a lot of sense to to have a plant like that there so whatever i plant in this bed Either that or I redesigned the bed so it's a keyhole bed and I can get at it more easily. I, I don't know. Well, you know, the wooden frame that uh, makes the box that is that garden is disintegrating anyway, so maybe I'll, I'll redesign it. But anyway, this, this one has to be given some thought uh, as to what's going there. Certainly, tomatoes made absolutely no sense to grow there. 
Um, and they, they grew okay, but I just did such a bad job of, of looking after them and tending to them. Uh, doesn't make any sense. So I think that just about does it for this part of the video. Uh, just reviewing last year's garden and what went well and lessons learned, that sort of stuff. And I was sort of explaining my process for how I, uh, year after year after year, you know, work my way through these different, <laughs> these different garden plans and, you know, learn from, learn from that process. <laughs> it seems a bit overwhelming, but it really isn't. I mean, it's just, it's just a picture with labels on it. And, uh, you know, uh, in the next video, what I'll be doing is I'll, I'll be using the same picture, but I'll be just moving these things around, deciding where everything should go. And I'll, I'll also be reviewing the list of things that I'm, ordering from from Vessi seeds right just going through the different uh you know different vegetables i'm using and for those of you that don't know uh Vessi seeds uh i got a coupon code for them again for this year it's the coupon code is gavs22 so use that if you want to get a deal uh, free shipping on uh, on your seed order all right but that just about does it for me for now so uh, we'll see you in the next video i'll try to get the other part out really really soon um, probably by the end of the week um, so that you can sort of follow through with that process with me and uh, also so I can get my order in. <laughs> Got to get my seed order in before they're all gone. <laughs> so I hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please like, share, subscribe and, and until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Thanks for watching.